let's move on to our last talk by William Dawson from the Recon Center. Uh, William, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you for so, joining us from Japan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good morning. <laughs> so Please, uh, start when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. So uh, I just wanted to start with some good, no good news. Um, this is actually a surprise two-part talk because I was looking at the list of speakers and I saw that my closest collaborator, Luigi Genovese, is also giving a talk and he'll give a talk tomorrow morning, your guys' time. Uh, so he's going to continue on some of the themes I present here, and he gets the privilege of presenting some of the cool applications we've been working on. So since I am the first part of this talk, then I guess I have the responsibility to give the introduction. So we are working on density functional theory, which I think you all are quite familiar with. And uh, I think you know that one of the reasons why density functional theory is such a popular method is that it has a really nice uh, trade-off between its computational accuracy and computational cost. And what that means in practice is that you can treat all kinds of systems with density functional theory. Nonetheless, in your research, I'm sure there has come a time where you wanted to treat a system with density functional theory, but you found the computational cost was just too high because it was just too big of a system. And indeed, if we use the standard algorithms for density functional theory, what we find is that the cost grows with the third power of the system size, so that eventually for these big systems, you incur quite a big cost. So with this in mind, for many years, people have been developing a new set of algorithms or alternative set of algorithms for doing density functional theory, which have costs that grow not with a third power, but grow just linearly with the system size. And so we group these together and we call them linear scaling DFT. And this is the kind of research that we are, work on, uh, that Luigi and I work on, and we're going to present about. And our research is not just about the algorithms, but we're also interested in software and even methodologies that allow us to apply density functional theory to big systems, really systems with tens of thousands of atoms. And uh, we implement all this work in our two software packages, which I'll just give a brief overview of here. The two codes are called Big DFT and NTCHEM. And they distinguish themselves from each other by the choice of basis set. Big DFT on one hand uses a wavelet basis set, whereas NTCHEM uses the more familiar Gaussian orbitals. And uh, one of the benefits of Big DFT's basis set is it has a very flexible Poisson solver. So it can treat all kinds of different boundary conditions, not just things like free and periodic, but it can also handle the wire and surface boundary conditions. And so when I think of using Big DFT, uh, I think of maybe a problem like I want to compute the interaction between a protein and a metal surface. And there I'm enjoying the benefit of having the ability to treat a surface boundary condition. And I want to be able to treat a very big system because of course proteins are quite big. NTCHEM on the other hand, as I said, it's based on Gaussian orbitals. And I think the benefit of that is that it's very easy to go from a uh, code that does ju not just pure DFT, but also hybrid DFT and we even have capabilities related to double hybrid density functional theory. And uh, so here, if I think about how we'd like to use NTCHEM, we might think about using a hybrid DFT calculation on a big nanotube. And here I get the benefits of hybrid DFT's increased accuracy if I wanna calculate something like the homo -limo gap. And both of these codes are hybrid MPI open NP codes, and they both run on our Fugaku supercomputer here at Recon RCCS. So uh, one of the research questions we ask ourselves in all our discussions is um, how do we get to a world where linear scaling DFT is a more popular method and something that people are more routinely using? And this is how I'm going to organize the talk. Uh, of course, the first challenge to getting to that, that kind of world is that we need to implement all those linear scaling algorithms and we have to put them into nice software packages. And so in the first part of this talk, I want to talk about one of the libraries we've been building uh, for sparse matrix operations that help us get to that. However, clearly, this is not the only challenge that exists. Indeed, there are many different linear scaling DFT codes out there, and they've all been demonstrated to be able to tackle quite big systems. But nonetheless, uh, as we found out when writing our recent review of this field, um, if you look for the actual practical applications of linear scaling DFT, uh, it's still kind of rare. 
And uh, we're trying to think, okay, what can we do to, to change that? And for that, I see two additional challenges which we have to address. The second challenge being that large systems, that these large systems we wanna treat, tens of thousands of atoms, are actually very complex systems. So even if you can perform the DFT calculation, it's really hard to go from that to actual insight into why the system you're studying has the properties that it does. And so in the second part of this talk, I wanna present our new framework, which post-processes DFT calculations and tries to get us some actual insight into what's going on. And then the third uh, challenge is just that, uh, again, these calculations are, are involving complex systems. So the workflows become very difficult to manage. Uh, indeed, you know, even setting up the system can be a quite involved process. You're almost certainly gonna couple multiple levels of theory. You have to, of course, deploy on large computers and even post-processing can be a quite intense process. So then I'm just gonna briefly talk at the end about our uh, new Python frameworks, which we're building, which can manage these complex workflows. And for all three of these challenges that I'll discuss, uh, the organizing principle we're gonna to use to tackle them is sparsity. And what do I mean by sparsity? Well, when you're computing a large insulating system or a metal at a high temperature, and you look at the single particle density matrix, what you'll find is that actually there's some decay going on there where matrix elements, which are separated by a large distance, the magnitude of these elements is uh, decreasing exponentially with the distance. Now, of course, some of you are maybe coming from a materials background, so you're not so familiar with this kind of picture, but you might have realized that this kind of sparsity exists when you constructed something like local orbitals, such as maxly localized Wenninger functions. And uh, so this sparsity is something that exists in all of the types of systems we want to compute with our linear scaling DFT codes. And so I think that this can be a principle which drives not only the design of our libraries, but also the type of anal analysis techniques we use and even how we manage the task of computing these large systems. Okay, so that brings me to the first part of this talk, which is about one of the libraries we've been developing for doing linear scaling DFT. So one of the bottlenecks that, oops, sorry about that. One of the bottlenecks that exists in a DFT calculation is that once we have the Hamiltonian H, we wanna get the density matrix. And the, the typical way that we do this is that we solve an eigenvalue problem. And this is a great way to do it because it takes advantage of these really nice eigenvalue solver libraries that exist. But unfortunately it has a computational cost that is scaling with the third power of the system size. So we're trying to look for new ways that we can get to the density matrix more directly from the Hamiltonian. And one way would of course be to compute the Fermi function, which I've written right here. And I wanna emphasize that this function right here is what we call a matrix function. And I don't know how familiar you all are with matrix functions, but I will say that it's a well-studied area of mathematics. And uh, the key thing to know is that it's a function <coughs> that takes a matrix in and spits a matrix out at the end. And uh, for those of you who are less familiar with matrix functions, for the purposes of this talk, you can just sort of think of them by analogy to the standard functions you're more familiar with. So you can think of a standard function like f of x is x squared as having an analogy in the matrix uh, times itself, or one over x having <coughs> an analogy in the matrix inverse. Or of course there's more exotic functions like e to the x which have their interpretation as well. So how do we compute this Fermi function? How do you go about doing that? Well, there are many ways, but one way to do it would be to approximate whatever matrix function we're interested in using polynomials, just like you might do with a standard function. So you could imagine doing something like Chebyshev polynomials, uh, where you approximate the function with an expansion of polynomials. And you see that to do that calculation, it's actually quite straightforward. Now, all I have to do is compute some matrix powers and do a little bit of addition. So there are many good reasons uh, to pick this approach and use matrix polynomials to approximate the functions we want. Uh, one of the best reasons I would say is that uh, the core routines that are involved here are just matrix addition and matrix multiplication. And matrix multiplication, this is of course the bottleneck, is something that is a very well-studied parallel algorithm. People know how to parallelize matrix multiplication. And uh, of course, we can also tune 
our library and be able to compute many different matrix functions using just kind of one core routine. So it's a very nice from the developer point of view. But the most important reason we picked this uh, polynomial approach is that in the case of spar uh, sparse matrices, when that organizing principle exists that I mentioned before, then we can replace that sparse uh, that matrix multiplication with sparse matrix multiplication. And then you can directly take advantage of that sparsity for a, a lower computational cost. And just as an aside, I'll mention that this sparsity exists not just when we compute the matrix functions that we're interested in for quantum chemistry, such as you know, the inverse overlap matrix for the, or the Fermi function that was shown before, but it also exists in other fields such as the study of complex networks. Uh, here, we, here we have the uh, matrix exponential being used as a type of uh, study of how communication flows in a network. And we do see that there is sparsity there too under the right conditions. So the first thing we had to do uh, to build a library based on these ideas of sparse matrices and matrix polynomials was to think about how we should distribute the matrix on the many nodes which we'd like to use for the calculation. And uh, we decided to use a 3D matrix distribution, uh, which I diagrammed right here. Now, of course, you should be, a, uh, you can probably intuit what a 2D distribution of a matrix might look like. You're just cutting it up into rows and columns, right? Well, the 3D distribution just builds on that. And the only difference is that we now have a third dimension where we're replicating data. So there's a bit of redundancy in the way that we store the matrix. And one of the reasons we picked this uh, distribution is that it actually maps quite well to the TOFU network, this torus topology, which is, was used for the K computer and now used for our Fugaku supercomputer. Uh, of course, this is 60 and not 3D, but you can think of this 60 one as being a three-dimensional uh, uh, grid with the extra dimensions being there to help ensure that you can do efficient collective communication along those dimensions. And we can do the matrix multiplication we're interested in uh, using this 3D distribution. So how does it work? Well, it's uh, fairly straightforward. We've, again, we have each process holding its local block. And then it does a sort of roll roll compute approach where we do a partial gathering of data uh, of course, it's, uh, here is the distinction of the 3D approach is that we're not gathering all the data, but just some of it. We do a local multiplication and then a final reduction operation. And I hope that makes sense to you, but if it doesn't, don't ask me a question. You can ask uh, Edgar Solomonic, who came up with it, and I saw him give that talk earlier today. Now, this is a nice distribution, as I uh, nice approach, as I mentioned, not just because of the uh, topology, uh, mapping, but uh, also it has some good theoretical properties for communication. But nonetheless, there is still some communication cost to pay for doing this. And so we try to hide that communication using a task-based framework based on OpenMP, where we have certain tasks assigned to each block of the matrix. And then we just have it uh, launch tasks based on which data becomes available. So with this uh, matrix multiplication built, uh, we now can then do the fun part of building the matrix functions on top of it. And indeed, we've implemented many, many functions into our NTPoly package. And that includes uh, things like standard polynomials. We have things like sine and cosine exponential logarithm. We have all kinds of matrix roots. And uh, perhaps, uh, and of course, most importantly, for the purpose of density functional theory, we have a method called density matrix purification implemented which computes that Fermi function I mentioned before. So that lets us get the density matrix without doing the diagonalization. And indeed, if we compare our, the performance of our code against something like EigenExa, which is a highly tuned uh, EigenSolver library, we can indeed outperform it and get uh, a lower cost calculation. And the NTPoly scales well to many, many cores. Here's some uh, scaling data from the uh, K computer. But I also wanted to mention to you guys some of the work we've been doing on the usability of NTPoly. Uh, we would like this to be uh, not just a library for a specific purpose, but something that you can really use easily with many codes. So it supports both real and complex matrices, 
It has parallel file IO that writes to the text-based matrix market format. So it's very easy to prototype uh, a code or your matrices with NTPoly. Uh, we have interfaces to many different programming languages. The underlying code is Fortran, but we provide uh, bindings for easier to use languages than that. And uh, also we have features for automatic data redistribution so that you don't have to worry about this 3D distribution. Instead, you can just tell NTPoly what data you have on your processor and it will handle the remapping. And uh, one of the interesting features we added most recently is something called uh, sparse matrix maps, where we can do kinds of Lambda operations on the sparse matrices, which is helpful when you're integrating into your chemistry code. And this is an open source code, which is also available part of the LC interface. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. And now in the second part, I wanna go back to that idea that, okay, we can do the DFT calculation on the big system using a library like NTPoly, but what do we actually learn from that calculation? Well, again, we're gonna to look to the sparsity and see what kind of insight that gives us. And in fact, what we would argue is that the sparsity is telling us that we should no longer be thinking of big systems as just jumbles of atoms. Instead, what it's saying is that you should be able to decompose a system into well-defined fragments, which are, of course, mutually interacting. And these well-defined fragments are defined based on the sparsity. So you go from this kind of jumbled picture to a more coarse-grained view of the system you're trying to study. And not only should we be able to break down a system, but we should also be able to assign what we call quasi-observables to each of the fragments of the system. And uh, what's a quasi-observable? Well, you know about computing observables of the whole system, but the quasi-observable is when we combine this kind of expectation value with an operator with a projection operation so that we get observables associated with the fragments of a system. So you can imagine running a calculation on a protein and you wanna know the charge of, an amino acid, of each of the amino acids well, that would be an example of a quasi-observable. And so what we've been building is a new framework, which we call the complexity reduction framework, which is able to do this type of uh, partitioning of a system and projection. And how does it work? Well, let's start by how it divides up a system into fragments. So one of the properties of the density matrix is that it's an idempotent matrix. And what that means is that if you take the matrix and you multiply it by, it by itself, then you just get the same matrix out. And this is a property of it being a projection matrix. So let's start with that matrix here. We have the full one, which we know is idempotent. And now we divided it into two fragments. The whole system is broken into two fragments. We'll call them A and B. Now, of course, we would no longer expect these kind of blocks, this KAA or KBB block, to be idempotent by themselves. It's only the whole matrix that is. And uh, so what we decided to do is define a measure, which we call the purity, purity value, which measures how much one of these blocks deviates from idempotency. Uh, in this case, this is the value we are computing, and this is the charge to normalize it. And of course, the reason why these blocks are no longer idempotent, unlike the full matrix, is that if you write out the sort of block matrix multiplication of this matrix, what you'll see is we've neglected these off-diagonal terms. And we, so we decided to name the off-diagonal terms. And we call these the fragment bond order. And you can see the definition of them here. And also see that the purity indicator of the whole system can be defined recursively in this kind of manner. And so what we argue is that this purity indicator can be used as a measure of fragment quality, whereas the bond order gives us a measure of how much two fragments are interacting. And these can be understood as a, similar to these more classical ideas like atomic valence and atomic bond order. So what are the things we can do with this kind of framework? Well, one of the things we can do is we can combine that purity indicator value with optimization algorithms. And so you can set a threshold for the purity indicator of each of the fragments, and then you can cluster up a system from the ground up into well-defined fragments of a quality that you're interested in. And actually what we find is if you use a strict enough cutoff for that indicator when you would do the optimization, 
you can reproduce the properties of the whole system by performing a bunch of separate calculations on the subs on these well-defined fragments and then sort of summing up the uh, total property. And uh, what we can do with the fragment bond order is that actually once you have a fragment of the quality you're interested in, you can see which ones it, what other fragments it's interacting with and use that to automatically generate an embedding environment for that fragment. And with this embedding environment, you can reproduce a quasi observable of that fragment, for example, the dipole of the fragment. And you can do this with a much smaller calculation. You can use sort of a cluster model where you've only included the fragments that it interacts strongly with in this model system. And uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention you, to you is our work that we're doing on workflow management. So we've been developing two Python libraries, for, uh, which are really the same library, which is PyBigDFT and PyNTCAM. On, oh, sorry about that. Can you still hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. Sorry. Sorry, my uh, wake up alarm just went off there. But um, <laughs> the uh, Py, these frameworks are used for managing the complex workflows that we need to do to study large systems. And uh, one of the unique features of our, of our workflow, I think, is that we, here we're always thinking about this organization of systems into fragments using the sparsity, such that the basic system object of our framework is actually something like a Python dictionary. It's a named collection of fragments. And uh, our Python for, uh, workflow manager has many different features, such as uh, one of the most important ones is it can do lazy calculations and remote job submission so that you can put your whole workflow into a Jupyter notebook. And the first time you run it, it launches the calculations. And then the second time you run it, it uses this lazy feature to see that the calculations are done. And then it gets you directly into whatever analysis you're doing. So this can manage your whole workflow this way. And one of the nice things about having a Python framework is we can now easily integrate with these other nice Python frameworks that exist. Uh, in order to do, say, uh, different levels of theory uh, in, in our calculations. And of course, the complexity reduction framework is implemented in our Python package so that we can now run these workflows where we're maybe doing high throughput calculations, where we're doing hundreds or thousands of calculations of systems made up of thousands of atoms. And we can synthesize that data into sort of graph views and these sort of coarse grain views using things like the fragment bond border that I mentioned before. Okay, I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. So I thought I would skip to some bonus slides here because I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about NTPoly as a, as a data structure. Uh, and some of the and some of the matrices matrices as a data structure. And some of the lessons we learned about that when we integrated NTPoly into big DFT. So one of the things we had to do for this integration was reconcile the fact that big DFT and NTPoly have different sparsity patterns. Uh, in NTPoly, what we do is we filter the small values, whereas in big DFT, we actually have a predefined sparsity pattern based on distance. So then I want you to think to yourself, how, how do I actually remap my matrix so that it starts with the anti-poly uh, filtering based view and gets to this fixed uh, sparsity pattern. Well, I think this can be done quite easily if you have the right data structures in mind, because this can be written as a bunch of sparse matrix operations. In fact, what we do is we start with this big DFT pattern matrix, which is a matrix of all ones. And uh, then we also, uh, Oh, sorry, sorry. We start with our, our old matrix as a pattern matrix and we convert it into all ones. So this can be done, is what we do there. And then what we do is we scale. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on this. <laughs> uh, then we, we create the matrix of all zeros, which is based on the other pattern. And uh, you can add the fill in by adding those zeros into your matrix and not filtering. So you take those zeros and you add them and now you have all the extra elements from big TFT. And then you do a pairwise multiplication with the ones 
to filter out. So these are the kind of things that we can do. Uh, and the ones will remove the extra values which are not in the big DFT pattern. So these are the kind of things we can do quite simply if we have good sparse matrix data structures. Uh, another lesson uh, we learned when integrating to ND Chem, uh, I think of when we wanted to create this sort of simplified Huckle uh, approximation. And the original ND Chem code was far more complex about how you do this. But if you have a, a good ma sparse matrix data structure, you can actually do this quite easily. So here you see the uh, formula for the off diagonal elements of this uh, Huckle guess. And actually we can write this as a sparse matrix operation where you only thing you have to do is extract the diagonal of the Hamiltonian and multiply it on the right by the overlap matrix, multiply it by the left, and then add them back together. And this can all be written by our sparse matrix operations of multiplication and also using our matrix map feature uh, to get out the diagonal. Okay, so that will do it for the bonus slides. I'm back to the conclusion. So uh, again, I've introduced uh, our work on linear scaling DFT and in the, put, introduced to you not just our two codes for doing it, big DFT and NTChem, but also our NTPoly library for sparse matrices. And then I further talked about our complexity reduction framework. And this is motivated by the fact that we wanna be able to not just do calculations, but get kind of really good insight into the properties of systems and where they come from. And then last, I showed you our Python framework, which can manage all these workflows. And the hope is that by uh, doing these developments, we can get to a world where they're actually very productive in doing uh, these large scale DFT calculations uh, and can more becomes a more popular methodology for people to do. And so uh, I'll just finish by uh, reminding you that my collaborator, Lee G. Genovese, will be talking tomorrow morning about similar topics to this. And he'll actually talk about some applications such as a study of SARS-CoV-2. So with that, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for the chance to talk and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, William, for waking up early and joining us. Uh, any questions? Oh, something in the chat. So it looks like there's a, a few comments from Susie. Susie, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, so I could note on the previous slide. What, what's that? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, like the preceding slide uh, on, on the uh, GWH? Yeah, this one. Oh, yeah, because, okay. yeah, this, this uh, like the generalized Wolfsburg Helmholtz Hose approximation is not a simplified extended Huckle method. So the extended Huckle method uses this uh, GWH approximation. Um, that's that's how the method works. And, and so the point is that the GWH is just a way of uh, basically building an approximate FAC matrix or, or you know, Hamiltonian matrix when you have some uh, uh, diagonal eigenvalues. And so the way this is implemented in most codes is that they take the core Hamiltonian and, and, and then uh, uh, use that with the GV, GWH. But uh, I actually showed that, that this is the worst possible thing you can do. It is even worse <laughs> than a core guess. And the core guess is horrible. So <laughs> I, I would recommend that no one, no one uses, uses this. So uh, the GWH, you can use it if you use like, uh, yeah, like a Huckle type guess. So you can, you can uh, use, use real like orbitals, atomic orbitals and orbital energies. And that, that gives something that uh, actually works pretty well. So I just wanted to clarify that, that this, uh, this is sort of, sort of incorrect. So, so oh. yeah. Thank you, thank you for your correction. And uh, also, I, I'm interest, very interested to hear that this uh, guess is not that good. Uh, this was in uh, the NTCAM code before. And uh, so I, I wanted to upgrade this implementation of it for the big systems. But hearing now that it's not so good, I think I'll, I'll go take a look and, at your work and see if it can give us insight into a better guess we should use. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is in um, a JCTC paper. Uh, like assessment of uh, initial guesses for self-consistent field calculations. I, I think, yeah, you can you can find it on my homepage. But the point is that if you use atomic 
like proper atomic uh, variables, then it will still be sparse or, or you know, at the superposition of atomic densities, that's probably the best guess uh, there is. And, and that gives you something that, that's pretty much pretty local. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Another last hand from Edmund. Uh, I see that, that uh, Edmund is talking, but actually I can't hear you, sorry. Myself. Um, I had a question about the sparse matrix operations. So in one case, you said that there's filtering done. So presumably in density matrix purification or the iteration for the matrix functions or uh, sparsifying as you go along in order to maintain linear scaling. But, um, but I'm not really familiar with uh, the other situation in which you said you had a fixed sparsity pattern, right? And so do you use that fixed sparsity pattern for each iteration of purification or uh, matrix function iteration? Uh, so to clarify on this, um, in big DFT, there is another method another library which does operations with a fixed uh, sparsity pattern. And uh, so in NT-Poly, we never use a fixed sparsity pattern. Uh, the reason why I wanted to introduce that, that conversion to a fixed sparsity pattern was just so that you could move between the data, data structures of the big DFT program to the NT-Poly data structure. Uh, in the case of big DFT, uh, there is a library called Chess which does the Fermi operator expansion directly with Chebyshev polynomials. And there, there is a fixed uh, sparsity pattern indeed, in which uh, it, ju it just at each step only fills in the elements of those fixed values. Are you using any sparse matrix libraries designed for Fugaku? No, it's, the... uh, it's, it's all done uh, with, our, with the code that's custom to this. Um, I think the trouble is that the sparsity that exists in our matrices is not nearly, there's not nearly as much sparsity as exists in sort of graph problems, which is what people maybe are more familiar or, or something like a multi-grid problem. So the sparse matrix libraries will get outperformed by, by us because we can, we don't have to make, we don't have to deal with nearly as much sparsity as they do. I see. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I have a question. I know the Fugaku machine is CPU only, but uh, do you actually have any plan to support the sparse matrix multiply kernel on GPUs? Uh, yeah, so I would really like to have time to work on that. <laughs> but because okay. Fugaku is a CPU machine, um, we haven't really made time to work, on, to work in that direction, unfortunately. OK, makes sense. Uh, any other comments from the audience? Uh, okay, so let's thank all the speakers again. And uh, like William already said, uh, please come back tomorrow uh, to join us for more talks and another discussion session. Uh, Alvaro, do you have anything else? No, except that.